Okay, so uh, as I mentioned uh, in passing, 1798 was the year in which Okinawans sent from Okinawa to China no longer were uh, exclusively people from Kume. Mm. Okay. You had, after 1798, people from Shuri were also starting to be sent to China and living here and working in the embassy. And as we know, the guys from Shuri were uh, often given uh, the, or let's rephrase that. Most often the post of, sh of castle or royal guard was given to people from Shuri. And mm -hmm. so the Shuri guys now have access to Chinese Kung Fu from the very late 1700s, very early 1800s onward. Okay. And as I mentioned, if they were befriending Bob, the security guard of the Green Sanders Army and learning Chinese martial arts, they were most likely learning a military art in the very yep. early days. Okay. Then they brought it back to Okinawa and one thing led to another, and now all of a sudden it's karate, or Okinawa te. Right. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, and I want to show you an interesting photograph from, I believe it's been dated to the 1880s or 1890s, it's somewhere in southern China, and that's this. Yep. Young Chinese men in Prussian style military uniforms mm. doing what appears to be Sanqing. Mm. Open hand Sanqing. I, I don't think that we know exactly where this was taken, but uh, the possessor, the owner of this photograph, a guy from uh, a blog, I think it's called Kung Fu Tea. T-E-A, not like okay. the Okinawa pronunciation of Te. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kung Fu Te. Uh, has dated this to the uh, late 1800s uh, Chinese rudimentary military training. And when you think about it, the Sanqin stance with its rooted uh, posture yeah. doesn't really lend itself to pugilism where you have two guys duking it out punching at mid-range to long range right because you're set what it does seem to be conducive to is negotiating a clinch or a grapple yeah. by sticking your feet to the ground dropping your weight and rooting for that split second so the guy can't knock you down yeah and then you break his, his, his grip and poke him in the throat with your fingertips. Yeah. So if you're a Chinese soldier whose main weapon is a bow and arrow or a spear or a sword or a halberd, and you find yourself in an empty hand situation on the battlefield, it's most likely because you don't have a weapon, the other guy doesn't have a weapon, and you're trying to grapple each other off balance so that you can steal their weapon and join the fray again. Which makes sense that the rudimentary posture would be akin to Sanqin with its split second heaviness and rooting to the ground so you don't get knocked down and coming between the guy's arms, taking his elbow, elbows offline and taking his throat or his eyes and then throwing him by his head. So you pick up his weapon and you go and join the fray again. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, if you're a castle guard in Shuri and you don't really have a weapon, you might have a stick. But if you're going to be thinking about how to negotiate uh, a situation without a weapon, you don't want to be waiting until the guy comes to grapple with you and then break his posture with your Sanchin and take him down. You need to have mobility and quickness and basically the speed of a sword fight with your fist, for lack of a better word. Mm. Right, so 
uh, most likely win these things three battles, right? nine methods, 13 steps. When these things came to Okinawa, some of them, I would imagine, were reinterpreted through the lens of the Japanese swordsmanship that the guys already were learning. Yeah. And so they, you would need to change your stance to a more mobile position. You would need to focus on quickness over sheer brute force in order to negotiate any situation, no matter if the guy is armed or if he has a weapon, when you have no weapon. Right? And hence, I see as the birth of Okinawan Te, or Karate, for lack of a better word, as mm. we know it, the Okinawan empty hand martial art. Yep. Right. Uh, so, probably uh, late 1700s to late 1800s. You have about a century of guys from Shuri being sent to China. Some of them possibly learning Kung Fu and bringing stuff back and amalgamating it into this uniquely Okinawan martial art. Come 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Okinawa, proof, uh, Okinawa is no longer the Ryukyu Kingdom, it's now the Ryukyu province, which was a few later, years later, turned into Okinawa Prefecture and made an official part of the Japanese political sphere. China, Qing Dynasty China, you have your Opium Wars, through which the Western powers, uh, mainly Britain, I believe it was, uh, tried to get like exclusive trading rights with China and China said no. So uh, Britain said, okay, we're going to get your population addicted to this drug from your country, <laughs> <laughs> right? And make them not care anymore. And we're going to swoop in and we're going to colonize China, right? So uh, the Chinese government is no longer in a position to care about Okinawa. Mm. Okinawa is now officially politically part of the Japanese sphere, right? And the Chinese military is most likely no longer guarding the Ryukyu Kong. But you have Okinawans, specifically the Kojo family, yep. uh, who legend tells us had a Kung Fu school within the compound of the Ryukyu Kong in at least the late 1800s. Uh, so what was probably left over was some rudimentary civilianized civilized civilianized version mm -hmm. of these rudimentary military grappling forms and so they were starting to be utilized more for civilian self-defense rather than battlefield killing tactics okay. along come your guys like Higao Nakandyo and Uechi Kanbu mm -hmm. A second here. Where is this? There you go. Who start to have what appears to be a more exaggerated Sanchin stance. Mm. Right? And you have this very Chinese posture, sunken chest, rounded back. Well, the Goju guy here is more of, of an upright position, but the guy here is an Oichidu guy. Yep. And, uh, he looks to be in a very Chinese looking stance. He almost looks like a Wing Chun master, mm. for lack of a better word, right? So very down and dirty, hunkered down, open hand, you know, breaking the grip and poking the guy in the throat as you're rooting to prevent yourself from being knocked over because you don't want to be knocked over even as a civilian. Yeah. Right. Uh, but they were not getting the military training. It was more of a civilized, civilianized uh, self-defense aspect. And I think that probably the late 1800s onward is where you start to see the more uh, self-defense 
in modern terms, oriented version of karate, well, karate tode being imported from China into Japan, Okinawa. So uh, these guys, Uechi Ryu and Goji Ryu, still use Sanchin as the basis of the martial art, whereas the guys who went before them and kind of learned more of a military grappling art and then reinterpreted it in Okinawa to meet their own needs, yep. kind of got rid of the whole Sanchin concept in one respect. And then the Chinese forms that we had in the past that most likely started like this, started looking more like Basai Dai like we have now, or Goju Shihu like we have now. So, uh, yeah, and uh, by the time Uechi Kanbun and Higao Nakanyo brought the Uechi Ryu and the Goju Ryu basics back from China into Okinawa, there was no longer a need to reinterpret it through the lens of a castle guard or a king's bodyguard who mm. already knew sword fighting. And so the kata kind of stuck. Not stuck, but they're, they're, they're still they're closer to the Chinese than the Japanese model of biomechanics. Yeah. But they're all still called Okinawa Karate in this day and age. Yeah. Anyway, that's a very brief, long, brief capsule history of what is probably the more logistically feasible version of Okinawans learning Kung Fu in China. Yeah. And of course, you have your Sapushi, the government envoys coming from China to Okinawa to coronate the kings. And of course, they will come with a retinue of bodyguards. And maybe some of the castle guards became friends with the bodyguards and learned some Kung Fu from Chinese guys in Okinawa. Mm. That's the other half of the story that uh, doesn't really often get uh, picked up on. Uh, stylistic creation legends aside, I don't think that it would be very logistically feasible or to be more blunt possible or probable, that a young man who is learning rudimentary martial arts befriends a Chinese bodyguard in Okinawa, who then takes him back to China and introduces him to like this great general who teaches him all the secrets of Chinese martial arts. And then he comes back to, to Okinawa and cre uh, creates a style. Yeah. First and foremost, when that particular uh, urban legend, uh, sorry, uh, creation legend uh, takes place was the early to mid 1800s. If you're not going on government dime as a bureaucrat or as a student, you don't go to China unless mm -hmm. you're a sailor. And if you're a sailor, you're going to China and you're staying in the dormitory until the boat to come back or until the boat's ready to come back. Right, so, do you know how long um, average that they are staying staying there? I think I read that it was about a year to a year and a half. Oh, okay, wow, a long time. Yeah, uh, and then the guys who went like after, like after the fall of the Ryukyu Kingdom and and the Qing Dynasty was like on its way out, and uh, Europe was dividing China up amongst itself. Mm. Uh, Right, uh, you had your your guys who were there for probably three, four, or five years wow. because they weren't on a government stipend, they weren't on government mission. They were there to basically get away from the upheaval that was going on when Japan was taking over Okinawa in a political sense and turning it into Okinawa Prefecture. Interesting. So, uh, Uichi Kambu Higao na Kandyo, uh, we don't have real actual official records of their ever going to China outside of the stylistic, uh, the style uh, creation myths. Mm. But uh, because there's a lot of oral history outside of those styles that they actually did go to China, I would imagine that they did. 
but they probably went there as draft dodgers. Not to put a, a negative thing on it, but mm-hmm. literally avoiding conscription into the Japanese army or taking a letter from your nationalists in Okinawa to the guys in China in hopes that they could get it to the government of China so that they could swoop in and save Okinawa from the evil Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's a very, uh, it, it, it takes a lot of the romance of the uh, myths of karate away. Mm. But uh, I've got a good friend, uh, Irish guy, grew up in Canada, lives in Tokyo now. Uh, he has a PhD in uh, history, so he knows historical research. And he always makes it a point to say that historical research is not about finding the truth. It's about finding as much evidence and triangulating it to come up with the most logistically sound hypothesis of what probably happened. Yeah, I'm hearing that. Because uh, as we talked before we started recording, history is written by the winners, mm. which does not necessarily mean that it's correct. It just means that it's written by the winners. Yeah. But when you start looking at things like oral traditions and, and things like that, you need to triangulate the information rather than taking it at face value. Mm. And uh, not to get too much off track and into details on another thing, but uh, every once in a while you'll see uh, posts on the internets uh, where people are quoting a specific interview with a specific Okinawan guy and calling it, you know, gospel truth. Mm. Saying, no, that's just what one guy heard from his grandfather and he told you. Mm. You have to triangulate that information with two other non-related sources. Otherwise, it becomes just one piece of information without verification. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Right. Uh, And as long as it's qualified as this is what this guy said, but I haven't triangulated it and I haven't found out other sources of the same information, that's all well and fine. But if you don't do that and you present this as, well, this guy said this, so this must have happened. Yeah. And then like, go off on a, a huge other tangent without being to verify and triangulate that information. Uh, basically, you are feeding into the uh, you know, political dogma and the, the, uh, the mythology behind history rather than trying to come up with a working hypothesis and then either trying to prove or disprove it. Mm. And any searcher worth his salt will, anytime they come up with a hypothesis, they will always try to find data that disproves their hypothesis. Otherwise, they have a, a positive confirmation bias. Yeah. And they will cherry pick data. So, uh, yeah, that's a very slippery slope to get down to. As we've seen in recent events, like, I don't know, the worldwide pandemic and the general public's response to the scientific process at work in real time. Mm. And seeing things like, uh, well, the scientists said this yesterday, now they're saying this today. I said, yeah, because now they have new data that disproves what they thought yesterday, and is now pointing at this new thing. That's how the scientific process and the research process works. Yep. You don't cherry pick the data to, to support the story that you already have in your mind. Mm. You try to find as much data as possible to disprove it so that you can discard it as another pipe dream and find a new hypothesis. If you can't find sufficient reliable data to disprove it, then you have your peers look for data to disprove and support your hypothesis called the peer review process. So, I mean, that's what we're looking at. And I think that karate research needs to be taken to that level if we're Mm. to be taken seriously as an actual uh, cultural uh, recreational study, right? Yeah. Otherwise it's, uh, you know, punch faster, kick harder. Yeah. Which is, I, I, as far as training is, is, is concerned, that's all well and fine. But 
why do we have to punch kicker and uh, punch faster and kick harder? How do you punch faster and quick and kick harder? Mm. And what is the the historical uh, hypotheses of karate movement principles and kata telling us about how to punch faster and kick harder? Well, that I think that is a whole other uh, discussion. Um, by yeah. Again. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that's a that's probably uh, five books waiting to be written. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, I know a guy who wrote five books on that pro- on that thing. Anyway. Yeah, I've got one of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, a yeah. different guy actually. Oh, different guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, a uh, sword guy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry. Uh, didn't mean to go so long on that, but uh, no, well, we're going back and forth between. You know, slides and, and the like and dictionaries and stuff, I think I needed to do for part of it. Well, the but, yeah. Yeah, interesting thing about the, um, you know, the, so many variations of hang, te. Um, yeah. The yeah. kanji for te does not necessarily mean yeah. this part of your arm. Yeah. You Although everything about- is related to this part of your arm. Yeah. Because you do your skills with your, your hands and your fingers, right? Yeah. No matter if it's an artisanal skill or mm. a martial skill. Mm. Right. Yeah. You, you did you uh, talk about that in your, in your book. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, before I get on too much of a tangent, I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was a recent movie about uh, some weird-looking UFOs that came to Earth. And they sent like a linguist in to try and to communicate with them. Oh yes, uh, the one with Amy Adams. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yep, yep. There's a there's a guy who like goes into that whole that whole thing and how language works. Yep. And it got me uh, to thinking of kata as a language. And not necessarily that, you know, if you don't understand the words and you can't sing the song, but uh, kata as a form of tribal storytelling. Mm. Mm. Akin to the hula dance or some of these other, in some, like the hakka of New Zealand, right? Yeah. Like a tribal storytelling through physical movement. Yeah. And uh, one, of the exa- one of the linguistic, linguistic, linguistic examples they use in that film review was surrounding the word, the English word, hand. And so it was very timely for me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, uh, I suppose the kata, it's some, somebody's experiences in, in a combat. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, uh, somebody's experience in the combat, mm. and it's somebody's experiences in the combat that was later distilled into the essence of what happened. Mm. Here's, I'm, I'm trying to look up that uh, thing so that I can share the link with you guys. Healing the Communication movie. Film Review. I don't remember the name of the movie. Oh. Uh, was, it, was it called Signs? Or, no, no. No, it wasn't Signs. It wasn't Contact. That was the Jodie Foster movie. Yeah. Um, Arrival. There it is. Yeah, I just found it in. Yeah. Good movie. Yeah, I, I it was. I want to watch it again in light of this whole tribal story telling mm. uh, thingy. But uh, it was a uh, very very deep and that that movie review got me thinking about kata as a, a thing so is that it arrival analysis communicating complexity arrive there it is talking in circles i think that's it yeah. arrival movies language talking in circles that might be it anyway okay. i'll find it and send it to you later maybe we can put the link in the description of the youtube yeah sounds good Sounds good. Yeah. Well, we might uh, leave it there for today, Joe. All right. But mate, yeah, look, geez, there's so many more things we can talk about. Definitely yep. uh, a couple of things in, uh, 
you know, movement, um, and also movement in bef before before we had the West Western style clothing, you know, yeah. and how that how that um, how that confined clothing, how that yeah. changed, um, or or more specifically, how we changed uh, when people started wearing looser fitting clothing, and, and how that. The techniques and stuff change. Yeah, yeah. This is a little book on no theater. Yep, yep. And the movement principles of the warrior class of Japan. Because I, I don't know if you touched on this before, but the, no theater was until the Meiji era strictly within the providence of the warrior class, the samurai class. Yep. And so the movement principles within the dance should be the same as the movement principles in the martial arts should be the same yeah. as the movement principles in daily life of a person walking around with two heavy swords at their hip day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So it was very fascinating. So I, I, uh, I'm actually working on a little, little bit of an introductory booklet on Japanese biomechanics okay. uh, in English, uh, uh, and this book is going to be in the bibliography, actually, obviously, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, ju good. Just just to give people something else to think about, and another way of of looking at the movement of the kata. Instead of, and I hate to say it like this, instead of just looking at the applications, I think looking at just at the applications kind of takes away of the from the cultural meaning of kata itself mm. and the original uh, usage of kata within the Japanese slash Okinawan society mm. and lifestyle, not just martial arts. So uh, yeah, yeah. Just how you move in daily life because that's really how you have to move yep. because you're restricted and you have two heavy swords at your hip yep. and you can't walk around like a cowboy. You're not wearing sneakers, or right. You're you're wearing uh, either uh, grass sandals that will fly off if you don't do it right, or wooden clogs that have you that high off the ground. Yeah, yeah. So, just yeah. uh, yeah. Another avenue of of research into karate that I think uh, really needs to be be done on a a deep global basis. Well, well you've got three months to do it. <laughs> uh, but and then uh, I want to also have a chat about um, the teachers' college and and the yeah, yeah. The teachers' use. college yeah yeah not not today but yeah uh, of course yeah, yeah. and then uh, <laughs> yeah so um, but yeah thanks thanks again mate but yeah so if you want to just check uh, just send me that link and we'll put it into the into YouTube um, sure. Uh, just because you brought it up and it uses the word hand as the example. Yeah, perfect. The word, yeah, <clears throat> like the word hand in English doesn't just mean hand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Cool hand Luke. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, uh, I'll give you has many different connotations. So, yeah, and so I guess we'll leave everybody with that thought for today and, yeah. uh, stop calling it Chinese hand. <laughs> it doesn't uh, make sense. <laughs> that's, that's right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, thanks, okay. Jake. Yep. Thanks, Shane. Uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, mate. See you guys. Thanks.